was an uh, urban fellow, which meant that under Mayor Koch in New York City, there was a recruitment program, really the only one of its kind, that uh, brought young people out of university into city government and allowed the fellow to pick the agency of his or her choice. It was right after the fiscal crisis. There was no money around to hire uh, people. And so this program was, um, was eyed by every commissioner because it was a way to get uh, talent onboarded and it didn't come out of the specific agency budget. So I won two fellowships, one for the summer and one for the academic year. You had to have finished your undergraduate work and you needed to be matriculated in a graduate program. And so I had no interest in real estate, had no idea of what the industry was about. I was on my way to law school and I was intending to spend the first part of my fellowship fighting for the rights of juveniles in the New York City justice system. And one of the onboarding sessions by the Urban Fellows Program uh, talked about being very generous in, and open in looking at places where uh, we could spend time in government. And inc they encouraged us to, to visit lots of different agencies. And the city was really a dump. I mean, we're going back to 1986. And which, which, by the by, a lot of the people in the audience probably weren't even born then, just so we're totally <laughs> clear on that concept. So I, I, you know, I, I went to school in the Bronx, so I, I was tough. But when I started to visit the various agencies, I couldn't believe the physical state of the of the city's um, offices. They would literally say things like, "Well, the rodent problem's under control. Um, we're going to put your desk in the hallway, and the peak temperature in the height of the summer won't get higher than 100 degrees." And this was time after time, just going uh, through all these old, antiquated buildings, these agencies that were so tired. Again, mission driven but completely lacking in, in basics. And I strolled into the Public Development Corporation, I'll be really honest, and it was air conditioned, there was carpet, there was a president, a board of directors, a receptionist, and I thought, this is pretty civilized. I have two fellowships. So maybe what I'll do is I'll spend the summer here and I'll learn a little bit about economic development and then in the September fellowship, I'll get serious about my career quest. And it was through that moment of serendipity where I decided to go into that agency that I realized that um, my love affair with real estate began. And I realized and, I had- And no one channeled you in that direction. It was no. completely carpe diem event. Now they were turning on the marketing really heavily. They told me I could go to city hall, that I could shadow the president, I could sit with the deputy mayor, I would meet the mayor. It all sounded great, and but each agency was doing the same thing. So I really think it was just an openness to the possibility that doing something outside of where I thought I, I wanted to be was worth considering. And I, I tell this now when I speak to people about your career plans, it's great to have a plan. We all have to have a plan. It's also really important to be prepared to upend your plan. And so I put my plan on hold. And then come September, I knew that I wanted to stay in that agency. At the time, you should all know that real estate was not as popular as it is today. I mean, being a real estate developer was one step above being a car salesman. I mean, it just was not a popular <laughs> profession. All of my colleagues were flocking to the internet. And again, in New York City, it's a dynasty industry. So you can only imagine what then happened when I realized this is well, what I wanted the, to So be. just so the audience knows, you know, that New York real estate at that time was completely dominated by a handful of families. Fair and enough. On some level, still is but yes absolutely and so what ended up happening again serendipitously is that in my age cohort there are very few people that wanted to go into real estate and i stepped into an industry that did not have a lot of people in my peer group by the time that i sort of got in a place where i hit my stride and those that were my age were family members of the dynasties in new york city so i was in some ways um one of one uh, being a woman being not in a family dynasty and uh, being the age that I was when I kicked off my career. So just so, again, the audience understands, right after the financial crisis, there, the, the industry was completely decimated by a generation for a decade because nobody wanted to touch real estate or have anything to do with it for quite a while, both at, in the early 90s after the first real estate crisis and then after 2007, um, and so this world of ours is really small right now, um, but comma, it's expanding ferociously in terms of the, you know, interest, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, which is, to me, it's fascinating because we, you and I come from a generation where there was like, where everybody knew everybody. Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. And, uh, and, you know, and your reputation was everything because everybody knew everybody. And if you were a woman at that time, you like stuck out like a sore thumb. But the world is different now. So let's kind of like fast forward from wh how you got started to sort of where you are today. So let me just take you through the arc because after spending close to eight years in economic development where at the time the agency touched every large scale public-private partnership being undertaken uh, in the city in the built environment. And so what I found fascinating was they would sit you in a room and ask you what you thought should happen on the Upper West Side or what should be built at South Ferry. I couldn't believe the scope and the scale of what was being discussed inside of that agency. And it was quasi-public, so it was run like a company, but it really was funded through the city's capital budget and expense budget. So what I touched was, was um, inspiring, it was significant, and it was quite instructive. And then I realized after seven plus years uh, into the Dinkins administration that the days of uh, corporate retention, which I spent a lot of time keeping companies from leaving New York City, and the days of building um, public-private partnerships uh, in real estate were, were gone for a while because Mayor Dinkins had a, a different agenda. And so I knew it was time for me to move on. And I realized I could move to the private sector and touch the very same scale of projects, but do it on the private side of the, of the equation. And so that is when I went to work with Bruce Ratner. And I ended up, as you said, spending 23 years at Forest City. And in the life of a developer, if you build one great building, you feel fortunate to have had a small hand in, in building something that's lasting. And I've had the great fortune of being part of building Barclays Center, the New York Times headquarters, and New York by Geary, which are three of the most significant uh, buildings that have been built in New York City in my generation. And so that, you know, you are what you build in the real estate world. And so, um, and that's really how you learn the business. You cannot teach real estate development uh, by uh, class. You really need to get in there and build. And so I am, again, the beneficiary of a run of buildings where I built 15 buildings during my career at Far City. And it takes a very long time to put a building together in a place like New York City. And again, I'm, I was just able to learn that much faster because projects of great scale and great significance were going on all around me. So, you know, I mean, let's be honest. So you have, you're a rarity in that you have literally dirt under the fingernails um, experience in building buildings in an industry that is in, to be blunt, is not particularly amenable to women. How did you, how did you like climb through all of that? Because, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta get through the city, you gotta deal with your capital partners, you have to deal with this, you know, all of that, uh, pull all of those pieces together in order to actually get something built. And it's not easy. It's it's not easy for a guy. It wasn't easy for a guy, but it sure couldn't have been easy for a woman to do that at that point in time. So I've thought a lot about that, Nori, that question, because I'm asked that question a lot. And of course, there is no magic elixir in terms of like what, what I figured out along the way. But I can share the following. Um, I learned how to function through very high dysfunction as a child. Lots of um, change and um, a need to really figure things out uh, quickly and um, be on my feet. And I think that I'm hardwired to be able to deal with um, challenges and uncertainty because it's, it's how I grew up. And I think it, it does matter in terms of the grit because I think grit is a big part of what, what you need in this industry. I also never got that memo in my inbox that said you should be intimidated. Uh, you should feel particularly sheepish about having a place at the table when there are 25 men and you're the only woman. It just never got in my inbox. And I think um, in some ways I had blinders on because I was just super focused and um, super determined to do my work. Now, I will tell you that I also am the beneficiary of a meritocracy. So Bruce Ratner, who had a very big hand in my career, um, believed it was the best man or woman for the job. 
and it's not that he ever said it. It's just that he let me, he let, he unleashed me and he allowed me to grow and continue to take on more responsibility because the more he gave me, the more value I created and um, the better the company did. And obviously it takes a lot of people to do the work that we do, but um, I was given um, a runway by Bruce Ratner. And uh, whenever I was with Bruce, I never felt that I was a woman first. I felt like I was, um, at some point I became his peer uh, and now he's a friend, but all along the way, I was in a group that were dominated by men and um, we were judged on our performance. And as a result, I did ex extremely well in my career with Bruce because he was willing to give me that runway. Which, you know, goes to, as you said, you know, sometimes we have serendipity in our, you know, in our careers or just luck. And, you know, you, you know, uh, you should thank Bruce Ratner every day, right? Um, because not, it's, Actually, that's, it's I, not wanted, I, want to talk, I want to talk about the biggest strain I had on my relation with Bruce Ratner was in the transition to becoming the CEO, which I think was a moment of being a woman that created a lot of tension for us. So Bruce wanted me to take over. The public company wanted me to take over. And I didn't believe that Bruce was really ready to pass the baton. And so I cautioned him and I felt I had the best job in the world because I was his wingman and I was, I was treated with a kind of respect and um, I got very good feedback in the industry because Bruce didn't want to do the kinds of things that I was prepared to do to, to run after projects, to hunt and to build. And so I really was reluctant to take the big job because I felt like it would be a lot of tension and friction in our relationship. And for two years, I insisted that we go through a transition where he would become the chair and I would become the CEO. And fundamentally, I was concerned that I would be sort of a fake CEO, that I would be, you know, there as a woman doing a job that was really being done by Bruce Ratner and that he would be behind the curtain and I really wouldn't be empowered to, to, do, to do that job. And I felt for myself and for the cause that I needed to be the true CEO. And I just wasn't convinced he could let go. And so for two years, I planned this ascension up into that role. And the moment I took over, everything that I feared started to happen. And he had very difficult time letting go and um, anything we had sort of committed to sort of went out the window. And so uh, I was dogged about making sure that if I wasn't going to run the company, that I wasn't going to do the job. And so I literally came a hair's breadth away from quitting. Um, so how did you convince him <laughs> to like... I walked in with my contract and I, Bruce, we laugh about the story now. That's why I can talk openly about it, but it's a very important story because it turns out stepping into Bruce Ratner's shoes would be the hardest thing I had ever done in my career. And why? Because he was legendary. If you know anything about the projects that Forest City built in New York, when you opened up the New York Times, it said Bruce C. Ratner, and it would talk about the Nets, it would talk about Barclays, it would talk about Frank Geary, and somewhere down the body of the text. And, and by the by, the Nets are doing okay these days. Yeah, fine. yes. But I, you know, I don't like Durant because he left the Warriors. Okay, um, fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, down the body I, I'm a San Francisco gal. I even had my, you know, my coffee mug with my tea with San Francisco. So I think Katie, you know, so sorry. I, I, he's not my favorite guy. But but down in the body of that, or any article about the company, it would eventually get to Forest City. But Bruce was a cult of personality. He really was identified very closely with everything that the company did. Stepping into that role was very, very tough. And so the only way that I got Bruce to understand how existential this was to me was by walking into his office three months three months after becoming CEO, putting my contract on the table and telling him that um, I was going to resign and that that I had put language in the contract to protect myself for a scenario where the scope and responsibilities that I believed I was given as CEO needed to actually be there. And so and, and how and, and their lawyers didn't like excise that out of the agreement. Well, it's interesting that the public company, the, the, the board of the public company knew that um, this was not going to be an easy thing. And so they had my back and they all, you know, the family flew in, the family meeting, and we went into kind of a corporate therapy. And uh, I, I can tell you the part that I'm going to own is that I was so determined to make sure that Bruce knew that I had this, you know, that I was up for this job, that I probably didn't do a good job of keeping him informed and having him feel like he was still part of the company, I was really trying to demonstrate to him that my span of control and my accountability and my responsibilities 
were um, were, were warranted and, um, and and that I that I could do the job. And so we we each had to actually come to a place of recognizing that he was having a hard time letting go, and I was I was having a hard time. Um, so know, managing um, if, you, if you're going to give advice to the audience that we obviously cannot see. <laughs> it's really jamming you up, Nori, isn't it? <laughs> I, 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 it drives, this drives me crazy. It, it totally drives me crazy. Um, because, you know, teaching on Zoom is horrible and, and not seeing the interaction and the reactions from um, the audience is difficult for me. But, so I, I just kind of want to stop, pause you there and ask you, like, you know, lessons learned through that process about how to, if you will, manage up that, you know, that that the students can, you know, really learn from about, about that whole process of, you know, managing up, which I say a lot in my class. And I think we don't, frankly, at HBS, I, I don't know where everybody else is from, I don't think we do a great job about having that conversation about how you, in managing your career, managing how you work with superiors, et cetera. And, and, and then your ultimate, you know, the owner of the company, or, you know, or not the total owner, but, you know, the guy, right? You're on mute, Marianne. The things I think I did right or that I did well in that, in that quest to become the CEO and keep my relationship with Bruce Ratner intact um, included the board, knowing that the board mattered. And so again, in managing up, it's also you manage around. And so you understand where the levers are and you understand you have to build alliances. And you and I know this, Nori, because we sit on boards and we understand how important it is for the CEO to develop relationships with board members, but also for board members to respect the guardrails and the relationship between the uh, management and the board itself. So there's a, a, a lifetime of lessons there. And it turned out that all of the investing that I did uh, with that board um, really did help me because they knew me, um, they believed in me, and they really did um, support me. The second is I was prepared to walk away. And the reason is that I felt so strongly that if the job really involved, um, you know, spending all of my days managing Bruce's uh, emotions around transitioning, that this wasn't what I wanted to do. And I spent two years doing that. And so sometimes you do need to be prepared to walk away. What it did is it just leveled the playing field. Bruce knew that I was serious and that something had to give. And that was a scary moment for me because, you know, the public shame of, of becoming a CEO and then walking away would have been pretty ugly. There would be no hiding from it, right, uh, out, out in the public. And I tell it to, to students because it's a really important object lesson, which is I was prepared to walk away because the alternative was simply unacceptable to me. But that requires grit. It requires, you know, um, a bit of um, bravery and certainly, you know, conviction around my beliefs. And so that was really, really important to me at that time. And the last thing I'll say is you learn very quickly who actually um, will do the right thing. So at that point, I'm running the company. So I am the CEO. And suddenly, you know, it's, it's impossible for the, for the company not to understand that there's turbulence. And so what ended up happening was people started to pick a side, right? And people that I believed had my back inside the company that I had promoted, that I had been peers with for a very long time, started to behave in ways that were quite interesting, ways that I never, ever forgot. But there were people that I knew would always be there and that would, you know, respect the chain of command. Well, can you elaborate a little bit, not the ones who support, what did the others do? Avoided me at all costs in the event that I lost and, you know, that I found myself leaving the company, that they would build their alliance back with, um, you know, making sure that Bruce felt um, important and comfortable and empowered and justified. And it's just interesting how, you know, it was, it was, it was unspoken, meaning Bruce and I needed to go off, not at the company. We needed to go off and work out our issues. And we did that. But inside the company, human behavior is such that people start to project, like, where is this going to end up? And you realize that it takes a fortitude and it takes certain resolve amongst team members that I brought along and cultivated um, during my time there. And I learned uh, a lot about the people who worked for me. And uh, it wasn't necessarily um, something I needed to act on. It was just something I needed to always remember. 
you know, the behaviors of a few people that surprised me in their unwillingness to stand up and say what had to be said or to continue to act in a way that supported my role in the company. And so you kind of learned who had your back or who did not. Correct. And I would also, like for the people in Zoom land out there, there is a, a really interesting paper on the importance of grit, which Marianne has referenced, um, which was a, a study done at the US uh, West Point Military Academy. And they said, you know, if you're looking, like what, uh, what are the attributes of success? It's not how smart you are. It's not how popular you are. Grit is the most, most important success indicator and you reference this and then when you get there and you're gritting it out right um and then figuring out the interpersonal politics which i think is an incredibly important lesson for the people who are in zoom land listening to all of this um i i, I just i can't underscore for all of you out there how important all of that is and and how hard it is. I mean, I, the one thing I would say, and I, and I ask you, like, it's hard to do this, isn't it? You know, I do hard. I, I agree with you. I, I, I sometimes wonder that if something's not complicated or complex enough, I, I lose interest. So I think a part of it is this, this business is not for the faint of heart. You know that, and I know that. And, you know, when I think about what you were writing about in 2011, I mean, you were on to some of the dynamic that we're, we're touching on here, and you've been talking about it for a long time, and you've been calling attention to things that need to be called and, out. And the audience doesn't even know what you're talking about right now. <laughs> I don't know, Nori, like I think anybody who's been watching the industry and wants to understand the composition and the demographics of our business, I think uh, would have come across your amazing paper on the pink ghetto in private equity. And when I, you know, when I, when I read it, I realized that you could substitute real estate development, owning and operating with private equity, and much of it was spot on still. So it really was an industry-wide um, expose, which called out what we all know um, to be the case, which is that underrepresented, underrepresented at the highest levels, and that it's not just the women who need to um, make the change, but that if we are going to change the industry, it really has to happen um, with the men too and with people in the C-suite well, and the boards. It's across the board. And um, there has been historically a systemic problem. And But that paper was published in 2000, a decade ago. And it's taken that long for all of this to really become important, which is so amazing that, you know, you have been so remarkably successful in an industry that has been ridiculously bad um, across the board, many different, you know, pick your category. Um, and for you to have been achieved the success that you, success that you have is just remarkable. And, well, let me and tell I, you I why. Well, let, me tell you, let, me, let me talk about why I left because I left Forest City on very good terms, but I left for reasons that I think are, are are touching upon where you're headed, which is you know 20 plus years in a public company, amazing uh, run of projects, usually impactful uh, work on the city, not just in the sky but at the ground plane. Tremendously proud of the work that I did and the team that I built while I was there. But I realized that as Forest City moved in the direction of becoming a REIT, that the days of building really aspirational, really important projects were behind us, that we would be more than anything an operating company, which, which we were, because everything we built, we operated. So I was operating the company, but the days of building large scale projects that are impactful from a job generating point of view and from a built environment point of view were simply not going to exist. At the same time, Forest City needed to find a strategic alternative uh, for its balance sheet and its business, and I knew that eventually it would be sold, and um, I wanted to, I wanted really no part of that. I just wanted to leave when um, we were on a high and the company was going to go through extraordinary change, and I felt that it was time for me to break out uh, based on all that I had learned with a core group of people that I wanted to bring with me, and I did it by going to the company and explaining what my ambition was, 
they fully supported my departure and actually asked me to be an advisor. And so I was able to capitalize my company with a two-year uh, bankable, non-cancelable contract with Forest City and then Brookfield. And the reason I did it, Nori, is that I wanted to build a real estate company that delivered beautiful buildings and great value, not just for the investors and for the partners and for me, but for the communities in which we build. And so this idea that you can build beauty and you can make return and that you can do that creating long-term value, not just for the financial partners, but for the community partners, I believe deeply in. And so my new company, again, in the private space where it's easier to do it, you and I both know how challenging it is to do anything in the public markets, um, allows me to pick the projects that I think are going to be most impactful. And I want to do the same scale. I don't want to just do info lots, but I will not build commoditized buildings. I have a company that looks more like the city we live in than any company I've ever worked at. And finally, the communities in which we build matter. And so that's a big uh, objective of MAG Partners. And I have absolutely no doubt, no doubt, you're going to be wildly successful. And I can't wait to see you on the, you know, the cover of the New, no, the New Yorker magazine as the next big New York real estate developer. Um, and with that, and, and by the way, everybody in the audience, that's going to happen. Um, I think we should open it up to questions because we're supposed to be done at 345. So I'm not sure who is managing that. Um, does somebody have questions? If not, I'll just keep on asking, talking to Marianne. But um, Malik, you sent me a thing a little bit saying, keep talking to her. Okay. I guess that means we have no questions. All right. Um, so, all right. Marianne, what's like the, you know, did you ever have a situation where you just said like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm out of here. This is like too much for me. Well, I did, speak, I did speak about that moment when I was the CEO, when I really was going to walk away. But um, the other piece of this is that I think I have another two dec decades left in me. And so I, I really do think this is all that I know and all that I've done. I have a lot of interests, of course, but I believe now at this point in my career, because I'm on boards of public companies and because I'm in the C-suite, my ability to impact change is greater now than it ever has been. And so I feel a sense of duty and responsibility to all of us, right, to kind of upgrade the industry. And so I'm really excited about that. And I think I can do that and also have a great run of building, owning and operating uh, buildings. As you know, the capital, doesn't matter what the question is, you know, the answer is always uh, the money. Uh, it is clear to me that the capital is waking up to the idea that diversity uh, in my profession is critical. And so even if it's not part of a weighting of sorts in an investment committee, it's always going to be asked, who, who is the operator? Um, who are these people? What do they look like? And so I'm having a moment. I have capital partners that are really solid, uh, capital partners that, that care about things like diversity and that are super, super um, supportive of, of me doing this because as you point out, it's unfortunately all too rare. And so I would like to see change. I would like when my daughter Tess uh, decides what she wants to do, should she ever decide to be in real estate, I want it to be sort of much more common that uh, women are entering the build the business and then rising to the top because people will tell you, and you know this, that there are plenty of women in the industry. Well, when you break it down by brokerage versus development, right, or finance and capital markets, or you look at where the women sit inside of the organizations, there's a lot of work yet to be done. And so I'm not giving up. I'm a fighter. They call me the velvet glove. I continue to believe that we have to fight and uh, I'm excited about it. So it's, it's, it's tremendously rewarding to have my own company because I feel like I can control a little more of, um, of what happens and why it happens. Uh, again, I feel a sense of responsibility, a great sense of responsibility, but I also feel like I've earned a place now where I can be more impactful than ever. Oh, with, without a doubt, without a doubt. You, and, and I don't think the audience necessarily understands what it took to get there. Um, I, you know, I think back on my own career and, and some of the horrible things that I went through 
um, you know, literal, you know, a, a, abuse um, in in the industry because it was just sort of that's the way it was at the time. And if you were female and you would showed up, so I, I I hope the audience understands what Marianne has done to get to where she is, and now given where you are, the impact you're going to have could be to use a a trite phrase, ginormous. Um, well, if I, I could, got, Nori, if I could, I'd like to, to just point out that they're really, let's say, a three-legged stool, if you will. It's a wheelhouse, right? So you got to know your wheelhouse. So for all the students, I'd say you really need to know your stuff. You know that because, you know, you can't afford um, to be um, weak and you can't afford not to know. And so one of my, my um, practices from the very beginning of my career was always to know my stuff and have a place at the table because of that. The second is the power of relationships. You know, this is um, learned over the course of many, many moons, but um, people really do matter. And it's great people that allow me to do great things. And so the people matter. And um, there's a running joke inside a company that, um, you know, if I'm building a building and, and somebody gets their coat caught on a hook uh, on the construction bridge, somehow they'll find their way to me and I'll take the call. And I always have. And it's incredible what a pay forward it is that I've um, very often been willing to coach and mentor and talk to people where my team would be like, why are you doing all this? It's exhausting. You just stick to the, to the business. And I can't tell you how many times these people that I've met along the way have come back to me in, in many different ways uh, that, that teach me over and over again the importance of connection. And then finally, it's the rookie. I think that um, we should all remember the importance of the rookie. And so in my team, in my company, in any work that I do, the rookie has a place at the table. And I, I like to say that, you know, sometimes the answer to life is outside the box. And for those of us that are doing this for a very long time, we stay inside of a box. And so I am a big fan of the rookie. And I think in a business like real estate development, um, there is a place for new thinking, fresh thinking, and young thinking. And all that's all really, really good for all of you because um, anybody who thinks that, you know, the rookie has to sit in the room and, uh, and, 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 and be quiet and learn before they can contribute, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a colossal mistake. And so I've learned a lot from rookies. I have to, you know something? So, and, and before, for everybody out there, um, my office over on this side is a damn mess because all of my students' papers are all over the floor. And I am learning so much about stuff I knew nothing about. And I do that every year and I find it, you know, to me, wonderfully enlightening about having an open mind. Um, and, I, and I think that your comment about, you know, being the rookie is really important in terms of having the confidence to step up and say something. And, you know, you know, like right now, like look at retail in the United States. It's a mess. It's a total mess. And we, I just did the, you, you would appreciate this, uh, Marianne. I just did the very old 20 year old, almost 20 year old case of Taubman's, uh, the, David Simon's attempted takeover of, of Taubman. And, um, and of course in, in December, it, happened and my question for my class was who really won and that was a really fascinating conversation um in terms of you know and 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 it's not our generation that's really going to figure that out it's going to be the people who are in this audience who are going to figure this out i'm i'm sitting here looking at some of the questions and it says what advice would you give the younger female generation entering this industry and we have a time check of five minutes so there we go don't apologize for being a woman i think you should be fierce i think you should again know your stuff and you should remember that grit matters and so um none of us are looking for an upper hand we're just looking for a level playing field and I think in some ways um, it's going to be a bit easier for you um, because of the work that Nori's done and hopefully some contributions I might've made along the way because we're all watching and we're, we're doing an accounting. And uh, like, for example, I won't go on a panel to talk about 
uh, women in the business without a couple of men on the panel. It's a rule. And so I think part of it is the conversation is here and now. And I think that you should be judged as a professional, as a talent, and as someone um, who wants to seize the opportunity and not, not that you're a woman. And so I would just encourage you not to get particularly hung up on it. But if you do end up with a job offer at a place where you feel as if it's not going to be a level playing field, then I would take a lesser franchise, a lesser brand, uh, and a better coach mentor who will give you that level playing field any day. So I think, you know, in taking your jobs, be mindful of how important it is to learn by doing and how important it is to have support and how important it is to make sure your level playing field is there. Couldn't agree more. And this is the sign in my office. All right. <laughs> This is a no whining zone, all right? I do think that's also important. Um, you know, I told my son when he was four, you know, life is hard and not fair. And I asked, you know, and if you asked him, you know, later on, he would say life is easy and not hard, but that meant he remembered it, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, life is hard and not fair. Um, but I think you're totally right. You just stand up suit up show up do your job and if they don't respect you if they don't give you what you deserve then you know somebody else will that and nori nori you know this but as a woman that also wanted to have a family and raising children if you are a professional in this business women particularly working women working mothers make incredible developers and you know why because we couldn't function without a team. We couldn't function without collaborating with other people around us. And I have found that the job of a developer is a job that is particularly well suited for women. And so I wouldn't be weak kneed about, and yeah, it's a tough business and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a still a, a, an old boy network, but the fact is women are damn good at it. So are men, but women are damn good at it. And I wouldn't forget that either. It, well, yes, because I also think that women are I'm sorry, this might sound sexist. I think women are really creative. And being a developer requires you to be creative in a whole host of functions. So I would echo your comment that I think it's a great profession for women if you find the right space. I, Malik, are we like, you, you sent me a note saying time check two minutes. Are we done? I, 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 I don't know because it's just me and Marianne and this is like strange it's 344 so maybe one more question I don't one know. more question okay does anybody else have a question um I, I have one here it says the future of mag partners what's your focus great so my focus is I'm working on three buildings in Manhattan there are three residential buildings and what makes them special is that the tax incentive that allows us to build affordable and luxury housing in New York City is expiring on June of 2022. Anybody who wants to build affordable or mixed use housing in New York City needs to get a footing in the ground by then. I have three opportunities to do that. So I will build upwards of 650 units of housing in the next few years, proudly, a combination of um, market rate and affordable housing in great locations around Manhattan that are frankly impossible to build uh, rental because everything's priced for condominiums. Super proud of that body of work. I'm working on a very, very big project outside of New York, and that's by design because our city is uh, extremely dysfunctional at the political level. And with all of the stimulus money flowing in, um, I have a, at once great hope that the city will get its act together and finally invest in infrastructure, education, and um, the economic uh, strength of, of, our, of our metropolitan region. But at the same time, we have a very weak mayor and we have, as you know, uh, an election coming up and we have a governor in turmoil. These, these things concern me greatly. So I have a, a large project that I'm working on outside of New York City, which uh, for me would be unbelievable if, if it works out. And uh, I can't speak about it specifically, but it's a very big deal. And I'm really, really thrilled because it represents everything that I like, everything I care about, and the things I'm really quite good at. And so I got a note saying we're at time. Um, Marianne, as always. It's always a pleasure best. to see you, Nori. We'll you're see the you best. Soon. I can't wait to actually see you in person. I'm so tired of all of this. Um, you Have you had your second shot? No, next week I will. 
So it'll um, well, happen take, soon. Enough. Take the day off afterwards. I, I it floored me. But anyway, it uh, it's so good to see you. Thank you and, for, for joining and agreeing to do this. Thank you to all of you for listening out there in the ether. Yeah. And good luck to all of you. The job market exactly. is very strong. So good luck and sending you lots of good wishes for opportunity. All right, guys. Thanks, Max. All of you in Zoom land. Good luck. Take care. Take care. Thanks, guys. So yeah, again, 